Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. The first combat submarines date all the way back to World War I. Since then, they have been absolutely integral to the operation of many navies around the world. True to their name, these stealthy sea vehicles can submerge to depths of up to 2,500 feet, allowing them to attack and defend using a variety of weapons and tactics. The construction process for a modern submarine is quite different from that of a surface vessel. For instance, many submarines feature two holes, an inner one and an outer one. These holes are generally made of plate steel curved by heavy rollers. These are then welded together into sections, which are connected to form the inner hole. The purpose of this is to create several watertight compartments which can help protect the sub if one part of the hole is compromised. An outer hole is later constructed around the pressurized section. This is what generally gives the sub its unique tube shape. The launching process of a newly designed submarine is fairly standard, however. The sub is generally placed inside a gated, manufactured canal known as a dry dock. Once in place, the dry dock can be pumped full of water until it is at an equal level with the water outside the gate. This gate is then opened, allowing the submarines to exit directly into the adjoining waterway. This dry dock procedure is a bit different. It uses a fully submersible platform that can be dropped beneath the water in order to retrieve a vessel that is already in the water. The large platform already has the necessary rollers and platforms to support the incoming vessel. Once it is low enough, the submarine, in this case the USS Pasadena, can be assisted into position by several tugboats. From here, the platform is slowly raised, allowing the water to flow back out and giving maintenance crews full access to all sections of the ship. The lifts powering this dry dock need to be extremely powerful, as Los Angeles-class submarines like the Pasadena weigh as much as 6,000 tons. Just because a submarine has been officially launched does not necessarily mean it's ready for service. First, the vessel needs to undergo a rigorous set of evaluations known as sea trials. In the case of the USS Montana, a Virginia-class sub launched in 2020, those trials tested nearly every aspect of the submarine's design and systems. These included evaluating propulsion, weapon systems, dive systems, and more. At the cost of $2.7 billion, it is crucial to ensure the Montana can perform every duty it might encounter, as well as some that are outside its normal mission. The Montana was put through a variety of high-speed maneuvers, both on top of and under the water. These trials took place under the close supervision of other vessels, which both monitored and provided visual assistance to the Montana. Should something go wrong, it's crucial they be able to tell the submarine crew as soon as possible and provide assistance in the case of an emergency. Many attack submarines are tasked with participating in search and destroy missions using various weapons. A 
Among the most potent of all is the Harpoon anti-ship missile. In order to be cleared to fire these missiles, vessels like the USS Chicago, a Los Angeles-class submarine, need to undergo encapsulated Harpoon certification training vehicle testing, or EHCTV. This process includes using specialized test pods that simulate a real Harpoon missile. These are inserted into the vessel's torpedo tubes and prepped just as an actual missile would. The missile is then fired from an underwater position. Since the weapon is just a decoy, it merely floats to the surface after ejection. Two, four. Shoot, two, four. Four, four two, four. However, the military now knows exactly how the submarine's equipment and crew will perform during an actual combat situation. As with all other vessels, the heart of any submarine is the bridge. This is typically located under the Koning Tower, which is the highest point on a submarine, and the only part that sticks outside the water when traveling on the surface. The tower and surrounding area generally contain active sonar and radar, as well as the periscope and other optics equipment. The entire control section consists of four main areas, including ship control, fire control, navigation, and con. The latter is where the officer of the deck gives commands controlling the vessel. At any given time, the control room can have up to a dozen people inside, all assigned to different duties. All these men and women are directed by a diving officer, helmsman, and chief of the watch, who coordinate with the officer of the deck. When the vessel is underway on the surface, the officer of the deck will typically stand atop the tower. This affords them a 360-degree view of the surrounding area. Using an internal comms system, he or she can directly communicate with the team, thus controlling the ship's direction, speed, and more. Meanwhile, every action called by the officer of the deck will elicit a direct response from the 130-plus crew members on board. This especially applies to situations like fire drills and general quarters exercises, where quick reaction times are absolutely essential. Communication is vital to the success of a submarine's mission, as is the crew's ability to respond to commands as soon as they're given. Like submarines, all military vessels have their own specific roles. In the case of landing platform docks, 
That role is to transport landing forces, cargo, and weaponry for sea-to-beach operations. LPDs also carry aircraft and boast a sizable hangar, not unlike the larger aircraft carriers. However, their smaller size and lack of a cattle bar system generally force them only to carry vertical takeoff and landing craft, like the B-22 Osprey, and various other helicopters. LPDs, also known as amphibious transport docks, are relatively new additions to the United States fleet. The first class of ships, the Raleigh class, was introduced in the early 1960s and only boasted three vessels. The new San Antonio-class LPDs are much more impressive and technologically advanced. At around 700 feet long, these vessels represent a construction challenge that is nearly on par with an aircraft carrier. Like other large vessels, the construction process is largely modular, with shipbuilding first creating various sections of the ship and then uniting these components together inside an outdoor facility. The process necessitates massive heavy lifting of cranes and hundreds of personnel. The finished vessel is then painted and marked before making its first journey into the water. The launch process of an LPD can be accomplished in several different ways. Here at Ingalls Shipbuilding, the launch crew first places the finished vessel atop powerful rollers. This allows the vessel to be moved sideways onto a specialized floating dry dock. This mobile dock is fully submersible, so it simply maneuvers out into the water and drops underneath the surface. This allows a team of tugboats to take the completed vessel and maneuver it into position. Ingalls is located in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and is the leading producer of ships for the United States Navy. This vessel, the USS Fort Lauderdale, was completed and launched in March 2020. It is the 12th San Antonio-class LPD to enter military service. Once fully crewed, the Fort Lauderdale will fulfill a number of important roles, including both offensive and defensive missions. These ships are heavily armed with Bushmaster II 30mm close-in guns. several M2 machine gun turrets, and a variety of missiles for both air and sea defense. The most important feature of these ships is their well decks.
These are water level internal decks capable of launching a variety of boats, hovercraft, and amphibious assault vehicles. These vehicles help the LPD accomplish their primary mission of bringing troops from the sea to the land as safely and quickly as possible. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.